Sound check, testing one, two, three, that stuff. Mic is on. The fuse is lit. The fuse is Alright, I'll wait until it it should give me a little pop up there. All right. I haven't gotten a notification yet. Maybe it, oh, it disconnected me when I left the building. All right, so here we are in the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group sound check. And as soon as I have a Wi-Fi link from my phone, we can establish that we're webcasting or All right. I haven't checked the web because that takes a second computing. I was going to bring a second tablet. But I figured, I said to myself, my phone is close enough. There it is. I got a notification. All right. Okay, all you people that are uh, standing around uh, waiting for the meeting to start, uh, watch your language because we're live on the interwebs. So there. And uh, this is the pre-show. So I, uh, I felt I needed to enhance the invitation to coffee this morning. So I uh, appended this uh, photograph of this gentleman. This, this guy comes from the Daily Otter. And apparently he's, he's as addicted to coffee as many of the rest of us are. No, somebody didn't Photoshop. They actually had an otter and handed him a cup of coffee. This is a real picture. He is a real otter with a real cup of coffee. What? <laughs> I don't know. The thing is, he, he does a show, and he's going to be on in a minute or two. He's like, give me that. <laughs> but seriously, uh, if you're going to be in San Francisco going to the Aquarium of the Bay, I wanted to tell you that they have this promotion uh, winter on the waterfront or something like that and there are a number of the attractions in that area like Alcatraz or whatever that are offering uh, coupons and discounts and stuff. So you go to the web page and you can get the child's price for everybody going into the Aquarium of the Bay on Pier 39. Uh, the only problem, the downside of this is that if you are an actual child, you pay full price. You do not need any sort of, of minor uh, or small person or <laughs> Hervé Valachez does not have to come. Uh, but how many of you know what this statistic is from? 81 per day. 
Dave Jaffe does. Anybody else? Dave, care to? Um, it's more or less than the average number of times somebody um, gets on their phone to check their social media. Oh, that's an interesting take on that. The, but it has nothing to do with the aquarium of the aquarium of the bay and Pier 39. The the thing is that if you're going to go into San Francisco to see this guy and all his buddies, uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, if you're going to go in to see him, uh, be careful of where you park your car because 81 per day is the number of car break-ins on the average in San Francisco. Uh, it seems like a big number to me. Uh, and. If you call and report a car break-in, they'll say, oh, that's nice. Good to talk to you. Have a nice day. And that's the end of it. Well, that's a good question, too. But uh, so we still got a couple minutes of pre-show. Uh, I don't have any items that are just random blather so much. Today we're going to start at 1 and... We've got a nice schedule coming up. It looks really good. We're not started yet. What is this started stuff? This is the sound check. If you've joined us prematurely, <laughs> well, if you're watching this in retrospect, if you're reviewing this, <laughs> did <laughs> I'm at least one of them. I may be two of them. I'm not sure. <laughs> David Smith has been putting in the uh, times and yes. uh, titles for yeah. every talk on all the um, recordings. I just like to thank you for doing that. Absolutely, and I wish him luck this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it certainly is easier to refer people to talks on the on the web and on social media when I can uh, link them to the actual talk within the video. So yeah, you. that's a, a really cool thing. I. I've always felt that uh, that that level of of activity. I guess you know you you do it, and how often is it referred to? Maybe more often than you'd think, and you'd hope that was the case. But yeah, sure. Well, all of the agendas are are online, going back into negative infinity. So we we don't I. I I guess he's just doing these for the future ones, not not going too far back into the past. For the, I I don't blame him. I wouldn't. If if somebody's looking for something to do, you can go to the roll call video, and type out the names as people recite them, and uh, and then uh, they can be put on the page as a caption. Uh, we can't tag the faces like they do in what Facebook or whatever, where you have a group shot and you hover your cursor over somebody's picture. As it turns out, that that may work in one browser, but you have to customize it for each browser. And Facebook has the time and the money to do that. Dave does not. Where you hover the cursor over and it, yes. yeah, but it, you tried to do it once. No, I, I've done it for a previous website. Uh huh. And, uh, and I, it I worked in one or two browsers, but the three, the third browser and the fourth browser, it did not. So now that we are 42 seconds past, according to the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. I'd like to welcome you to the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group and uh, the afternoon session uh, for January. And George, uh, you're on deck. You wanted to talk about rumors, gossip, announcements, and stuff. Uh, 
The first thing I wanted to mention, we have copy issues of uh, uh, starting forth. And I had it in mind to send uh, to send some to Leo Brody, uh, ask people to uh, commit to wanting one, uh, and as a fundraiser, get an agreement from Leo. I haven't contacted him yet, so if you're saying, oh, you're just assuming Leo's going to do that, I'm not assuming that. So this may all fall flat on its face when Leo says bugger off, as well he should. Uh, so what I'd like to do is say, OK, if you raise your hand in a minute, uh, I'll take your name down. I'll ask Leo, OK, Leo, will you inscribe these books if we send them to you? And Leo will say yes, because he's a sport. And uh, then uh, they'll come back here with, uh, I'm so glad we share forth uh, Leo Brody or some other message. You can maybe specify the message that you'd like. Uh, it reminds me of the guy that uh, had a book on email etiquette. And he gave a nice talk, and I had him sign his book afterwards, and it said something like, no cats were harmed in the making of this book. Uh, but seriously, <laughs> he didn't actually eat any cats, but we digress. Uh, so uh, da, 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 da. show of hands, how many of you would be interested in having an inscribed Leo Brody, maybe Chuck Moore on fourth day. Uh, uh, he's willing to sign things if you ask him nicely, I'm pretty sure. Uh, show of hands, anybody interested in spending money on this besides me? Okay, we got one or two. So it's, it's not as silly as I thought it was going in. Now, uh, Andreas uh, saw something interesting, and he's going to tell us about it. Looks like uh, James Bowman has released the game Duino 3 uh, and uh, it was successfully uh, crowdfunded, it, it seems. And uh, check it out, it's, it's pretty cool. Has it got new and exciting features? Uh, yeah, there's uh, a list which I was looking at, a list of uh, new capabilities. Uh, so it's four times more power. Um, I, I'm not sure like exactly how it compares. But. All right. So it's really cool. Yeah. And we don't usually go in for sequels, but uh, in this case, we'll, uh, we'll agree that uh, it uh, sounds like it's worth your time to check into that. So, George, you want the mic? or? Uh, no, I'll just say that after uh, chatting with my fellows here, I realize I'm not going to be telling you anything that you don't already know. So... Be sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not paying that much attention to the news these days. I guess Trump is off in Europe talking to Stavros Blofeld from the Bond movies. I know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks. I got I'm glad I, I got one chuckle out of that. I appreciate it. So uh, let's see. Uh, I have a list here. We've exhausted it. So uh, we might take two minutes for sound check, but Brad, you're up. It says right there on the label. Let's see, 1455 break. No, before that, fourth haiku update at Al. Al's not here today.
last time we... Uh, so it's been a little while since we, we took a look at our... All right. Uh, all right, I thought... Oh, come on. <laughs> Wait, what? One second. running Windows? Nope, Linux. Um, all righty. Um, so I thought we'd uh, check in on uh, our various haiku submissions, because we haven't done that in a bit uh, before the other talk. Uh, not not a whole lot going on, but a few few items. This is looks like a redo of something old. Let's uh, bring ourselves up to the present. Uh, huh. Okay. Somebody is learning the basics. Oh. Well, this has got something or other. That's kind of cool. We're starting to get ones with cameras, it looks like. Um, anemia. Okay. guess that's kind of anemic. Uh, huh. Okay. Ooh. Okay, this might actually be into ones that we had seen before. Whoa, okay, I'm pretty sure that's one we've seen before. And, yeah. Triangles. Ah, okay, here's something definitely new. So, I think he's been doing laundry in uh, imitations. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm duly impressed. I actually want to look at the code. Okay, uh, lots of data, it looks like. So... Very cool. Variation. Are these particular uh, particular instances of? Uh... Oh, well, I just grabbed them from the uh, Google. Ah. Yeah, Google pictures. How, how accurate are they? Are they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are what they are. One percent. All righty. Um. He definitely has a nice color scheme. This is that uh, you can look at these uh, pictures uh, in two different uh, views. Mm -hmm. One view is uh, rectangles. Mm -hmm. and basically, you construct everything from re rectangles, and anything you don't uh, draw, it's a black. Mm -hmm. And the other way, if, if the black lines predominate, you probably want to draw the the lines mm. instead of uh, uh, focus on the triangles, uh, mm. uh, the, the rectangles. Uh -huh. So if you have, for uh, example, this one is mostly lines, uh, very few rectangles, mm -hmm. and then you just draw the lines and then fill it up with uh, huh. the, uh, a few rectangles. So very cool. But it's uh, it's amazing that uh, mountains. Uh, it's a very simple, very geometric, mm -hmm. but it's extremely beautiful. Oh yeah. Is are there is there a particular? I feel like uh, I think it's uh, this one in particular seems vaguely familiar. Are there are there ver variants that are particularly famous? Is that the? Uh, mm, I don't know. Uh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that a number of years ago I uh, uh, visited uh, Washington. Uh, with my wife, and we just happened to uh, to see this mountain a special uh, display <laughs> one of the museums. So I, I was uh, I was uh, very very impressed. Yeah. The, uh, the which which, which sorry, which museum is it? which museum are they in? Uh, one of the Smithsonian. Ah, uh, oh, part of the Smithsonian. Uh. I don't I don't remember. Yeah. But, uh, I bought a book, yeah? uh, and I gave it away, uh, and I said, oh, I want to make this thing cool <laughs> with the painter. <laughs> and so I searched on the Google, the guy who paints the rectangles. <laughs> <laughs> Piet Mondrian, <yeah? laughs> very cool. All right, uh, some anonymous thing here, it looks like. Gosh, Melly. Okay, that doesn't really. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, actually, no, no. It's interactive. That's why. Okay. Oh, it's interactive. Yeah. 
it's doing something with the mouse. But apparently not very much. So. Okay, similarly here. That's a Sam Chang again. Oh, interesting. He's clipped it to the so that even when you're outside of cute jet color palette. All right. Hmm. Someone's variation. Oh, it bends around into a rainbow. Aha, uh -huh. fractal. How big is this one? Not very big. Wow, that's that's really impressive. Wow. <laughs> uh, so he's got powers of two going on there. I wonder. I'm trying to think what he's. The level of recursion. Must be, yeah. Wow. Very nice. And then he's adding them, adding them all up. That's interesting. I wonder. I, well, we'll have to pull that separately. We can. It'd be interesting. To, that one definitely looks like it'd be interesting to sort of pull out the pieces and see see how it works. It's sort of tractable to understand. Blurry photo. Somebody's got yeah. It's a blurry photo. Yeah. Huh. I'm not sure what. Oh, yeah. Static TV. Something sludge TV. Oh, we wrapped around, so that, that was it. Okay. Alrighty, on to the main attraction. I'm going to try one more time to get my screen uh, in a form where I can actually see the uh, see the display. I don't know why it decided to uh, mirror displays. Okay, let's see if that'll stick. Uh, keep this con ah that was probably what I didn't push last time. All right, so I am going to oops All right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, sign distance functions uh, in fourth. before I do that, uh, I thought I'd do a little aside about this slide deck because I, I, I went back to something that I hadn't touched for a while and, and uh, this sort of happened in a whim partially because I, for this talk, I wanted to do some, some graphics um, and, uh, and so I pulled out some of my old code to do that and uh, for once actually reused something. Um, so uh, if you'll recall back in 2013, I did a talk on doing uh, scalable fonts and forth. Uh, and uh, at that time, I tried to make an extremely small scalable font with a, a very small library around it. Uh, it had, had the odd name Gimple. Um, and uh, so I went back to that code. And, and with that particular talk, I had also done the slide deck, but I kind of did the slides as a one-off thing. And so I, I changed around that old deck to, to make it into sort of a common vocabulary that I could use uh, for this talk. So. Um, but along the way, I was looking at the, the old font, and, and the old font, my, my goal had been sort of, you know, absolute minimiz, minimalism, uh, and it, it was, you know, 585 bytes, so it was extremely, extremely small, and, and I did sort of almost nutty things like, you know, insisting that none of the, the characters have more than, than three strokes, and a bunch of the, I think it's the lowercase letters are all in two strokes, so, so it's, you know, extremely uh, uh, sort of pithy, but it's a very... Uh, not exactly, it's almost Comic Sans-like kind of uh, uh, handwriting-like font. And, and some of the, there were some weird uh, quirks to it, like you'll notice the percentage sign is extremely uh, unusual for a percentage sign. Um, so I decided to go back and say, well, what, what, if I, what if I wanted it to look a little bit nicer, but not, uh, but, and, and sort of break some of my rules before. And so, so I called this one Dragon, just sort of grabbing a name out of thin air. Um, and so a lot of it, you'll you'll see is very similar, and there are several characters that are the same, um, but, I, but I sort of, uh, you know, w w where an extra, uh, an extra stroke would uh, make the font look nicer, I, I, I largely took the opportunity. Uh, a few of them I, I kept as is, like the, the at sign uh, I was happy with, for example. 
Yep, pound sign change. There's a whole whole bunch of little. Uh, you'll notice, especially in a lot of the lowercase letters, that because those have been uh, working with with just two two strokes per uh, per character, that there's quite a bit of improvement in in their uh, shape. It l makes it l look sort of less less wiggly. Um, it's not that much bigger. It's only 744 bytes, so it, it was only a you know sort of 50 percent increase. So, um, and I figure this this bumps it up into the territory where I could actually tolerably look at it and not, <laughs> not uh, be gassed by it. So, um, not entire, there's a few places, that I, I still stuck to the, if you'll recall the old talk, I was operating on a very uh, restrictive grid in terms of how the font is laid out, and so I, I stayed on that grid, and so there's some places where I'm not completely happy. You'll notice the lowercase s is a little bit goofy because it doesn't, uh, line up on even multiples, so it can't be uh, symmetric and, and be that height. Um, and uh, there's a few other weird plate. You'll notice like the nine and the six don't quite uh, match up because it was challenging to get them to uh, connect in, in, in that way. Um, so that's that. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is I revised it to, to have a little mini vocabulary for doing slides, so I can do the, the slide deck in fourth, and, and this deck is is done that way. So you declare a slide and and have various bullets inside, and uh, and oh, the spacing's wrong on that. But the, there was this sort of meta problem for making this particular slide of uh, putting the working around the escaping that would normally be present in the uh, in the slide. Not entirely sure I'm happy with it, but I, I, I realized at some point I'm fiddling with the, the slide deck mechanism and not actually preparing the talk. So best to move on. Um, the good things about this, it, it uses fourth, it, 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 uh, it integrates with generated graphics, so I can have things in line in the, in the slide deck that are running live. The downside is that the deck only runs on Linux at the moment, and there's no easy way to export it. So this will be one of these talks that goes sort of into the abyss where I, I won't have the, the web link to it, at least not trivially. Um, that might be something worth revisiting. I'm going to do this more often. All right, so on to the main presentation. Um, so uh, something on, somewhat on a whim, I decided to uh, think about what uh, sign distance functions would look like uh, done in fourth. Um, they're in, in, in the computer graphics space, they've been uh, sort of getting a, a little bit more attention in the in the, the last you know five five six years or so. Um, the, the basic idea is that you uh, you think about the 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 uh, distance uh, to you, the distance to uh, the nearest surface. Uh, and, uh, and it's signed in the sense that if you're outside the surface, the value is positive, and if you're inside the surface, uh, the value is negative, and if you're on the surface, the, the value is zero. Um, and this has a, has a bunch of useful properties. Um, there's all kinds of sort of things that it, 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 uh, it I think it most very sort of initially popped up in people's consciousness uh, uh, used as a, a technique for doing scalable fonts. Uh, where you've got the font represented in a texture. And so you have a texture that's, that contains the signed uh, distance function of the font, and then you can use a shader to, uh, to trans transform that into something that's, uh, that uh, you can scale. And it has a bunch of other desirable properties, like if you, um, if you uh, sort of uh, uh, round it, uh, or sorry, if, you, if you, 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 you add to the signed value, you sort of make the font bolder. If you decrease the... Uh, the value you make the font thinner, that that sort of thing, um, and then it's also used for a uh, a rendering technique called ray marching, um, which and and then the other sort of desirable property uh, that goes in tandem with that is that it, it works well with with uh, constructive solid geometry. Um, so why do this in fourth? Um, one thing is it's appealing because it's a it's a very simple uh, way of representing uh, geometric ideas. Um, it's, it's also very numerically simple. It, uh, unlike a number of other uh, techniques, uh, ray tracing, for example, suffers from uh, cases where you end up with very small values, especially when you get close to a surface and you're trying to do some calculation, whereas sine distance functions are uh, typ typically they're very numerically stable, uh, which makes them kind of desirable. And, and also because of that, uh, especially you don't need a lot of dynamic range, so you don't need floats, so you can do this all sort of in integers. Um, and then the other the other fun thing with them, and this is where they come up in fonts, is they work well when you resample them. So if you have something that's expensive to compute, you can compute it once, do some sampling of it, and then uh, sort of do general things with it. Uh, and, and the other thing is 
thing. It's a very, uh, the representation is very general. You can go from a sign distance function uh, and figure it, take the gradient and, and then think about, use that to find surface normals. So you don't sort of have to think about, about both, I have a 3D model and what is its, uh, what is its geometry and then separately sort of keep track of things like surface normals. You can have one representation that, that captures all of that. So it's sort of succinct. So um, the, I, I decided to use the pattern uh, of just having a couple of uh, uh, x, y, and z as, as, as variables to track the current point of interest. I figured that was an, a simple enough way to do things. And so you can just easily represent a sphere by you know, taking, uh, taking the uh, Euclidean distance and, uh, and, uh, and then subtracting that from the radius. And so you're at the center of the sphere. You figure out, figure out how far away is this point from the, uh, the center of the sphere, subtract off the radius, that gives you your sine distance value. So what that looks like, um, so in this diagram, um, yellow, is, uh, yellow is negative and uh, blue is positive, and, uh, and then uh, black is, you know, as you get to zero, and then right at zero, I've marked it with red. And so for something like, this is a slice down the middle of, of, a, of, uh, of a sphere uh, at the origin, and you, you uh, as you get, you know, closer to the center, and, and by the way, the blue here, of course, gets infinitely large as you get far away, but on the inside, you converge at some, you know, maximum negative value that's equal to the radius. So that's, that's sort of what it looks like mathematically. The cool thing about it is that doing, doing CSG operations on it are very easy. You can just do min to do uh, a union, and so the idea would be if you had two, uh, two spheres, for example, in some, uh, transformed relationship, and you wanted to figure out what is the, uh, the sine distance function to uh, uh, the union of those two things, you just pick the, whichever one is closer is, uh, is, uh, is going to be the, the closest point. And so that means that you can just, with a, the, min, the min operation, find the union of their shape, and you get this sort of combined you know, thing in terms of what the, the actual sine distance value is, but the, uh, the critical thing is that that uh, shape around the surface uh, is there. And, and then again, this is just a, a slice down the middle of one of those. And similarly, you just do max to do intersection. So that's, that's relatively straightforward. And then you can find the intersection of two, two, uh, two objects. Um, uh, inversion is just uh, negation. And so you can just flip it so that now you, you get negative values on the outside and positive values on the inside. And combining inversion and intersection, of course, you can then do difference so that you could, uh, this one you're gouging, creating a donut by gouging, well, actually not a donut, you're creating a hollow sphere by gouging, gouging a, the center out of uh, another sphere. Uh, and again, this is, we're seeing that because this is a, a slice, a 2D slice down the middle. Um, so other, other, uh, other kinds of geometry are, are similarly straightforward. Um, you can do a, a box in, in X, Y, and Z of different sizes by just uh, finding the absolute value distance from uh, the center on either side and then subtracting those. And then you use max, which are, again is, uh, is intersection, to intersect sort of, you know, if you imagine a, a, a sort of a, a, two pl a, a sort of a planar slice intersecting with another planar slice, intersecting with another planar slice, that gives you a box. And so in, in cross-section you can get uh, you can get a cube or, 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 or an arbitrary rectangular prism. Um, and then uh, a cylinder, similar idea, right? You can, um, you can take the, uh, the, uh, you can take the, uh, the x and y uh, distance and get that cylindrical shaft and then intersect that with a, uh, with a, planar, uh, uh, a planar slice and then get uh, a cylinder. And of course, <laughs> cutting through the middle again, these are all 2D slices. That just looks like looks the same as the sphere, but uh, but it would it would end vertically somewhere. Um, and then, uh, of course, what you what you end up wanting to be able to do is to uh, uh, transform that geometry. So typically, if you're building up a model, you would want to be able to have a bunch of shapes and then uh, transform them in various ways, and and uh, and then figure out the sine distance function for the entire set of them together. Uh, so to do that, I, I, I set, a, set up a, 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 what I call the geometry stack, so just another stack uh, that I stash the current x, uh, x, y, z position to, 
uh, on entering uh, sort of a unit of geometry and then pop it pop that up back off uh, when I exit it. And so then within that unit of geometry, I can do operations to transform X, Y, and Z. I can do rotations or, or, uh, or translations uh, and, and it, uh, it will affect just that one region. Um, there's a, some, a little bit of uh, nuance if you wanted to do scaling. Uh, you, have to, you have to be very careful with how you scale. Uh, the XYZ values, or similarly, there's, um, if, especially if it's non-uniform scaling, there's a bunch of caveats to that. Um, and then, uh, but but uh, you can you can generally do uh, a, a lot just by transforming that one point. Uh, and then what that lets you do is is sort of um, uh, create a a, a model uh, just sort of in a little uh, hierarchical language. You can have Something like, say, a sphere at some position that you transformed, and then in a, in a re relative to that, you could, you know, sort of go forward tw 20, and then have a bunch of other objects that you maybe s subtract out of that to construct something. So something like this uh, could turn into something like that, where you've taken a sphere, gouged out some cylinders, gouged out a uh, gouged out a, uh, a rectangular prism. Um, and then, uh, then of course, you want to do this technique called ray marching uh, if you wanted to actually render that in 3D. And so, the idea with ray marching is that you're, uh, it's a, it's a sort of an interesting trade-off. It's become, I think, partially popular because with a lot of the computing hardware now, where you can sort of do lots of things in parallel, sort of dumbly, uh, it's a lot easier than ray tracing um, in that in that space because you, with ray tracing, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of sort of contingent decisions where I'm going to cast a ray out into the world, see what it hits, figure out where that goes, and all of that. Um, and it's it's almost easier if you you make the the individual decisions simpler. So with ray marching, what you do is rather than have a single intersection calculation to figure out if an object has has been hit, you use the sine distance function to say from some point how far can I go in all directions before I hit something. And then along the path of the ray, you can then say, well, because nothing is in this space that I'm in, I can go at least this far and jump that far ahead. And then you go again from this spot and say, what, what's in this region? How far can I go without hitting something? And then you go to the surface of the sphere and so on. So you have to do that for several steps, um, but it's a much simpler calculation. Um, the, yeah. Uh, and this, yeah, I was trying to show that visually here, but this is the same sort of, oh, and that scaled funny. But anyways, the, the idea would be you would, again, from some point, you figure out how far can I go without bumping into something? Okay, I can jump to here. How far can I go without bumping into something? I can go to here, and so on. Um, and then once you, uh, once you find some intersection point, um, you'll, you'll want to be able to find the surface normal there. So you, you, you do this until you get to zero, or you can, in a lot of... Uh, uh, like in shaders, sometimes folks will just even just do it some number of finite iterations and assume that they'll eventually hit uh, they'll hit, hit something or they'll go off off out out of the scene. And then at that intersection point, you can just simply sample the sine distance field uh, at at you know off at a small epsilon distance in each direction and get a gradient, and that gives you your your surface normal. Uh, and then you could do a lighting calculation. Uh, so where I'm at in, in, in my implementation is I, I've, I've implemented the, the, uh, the, the, the basic shapes, and I've implemented the transformations, um, and then the ray marching. So I figure out, okay, I'm casting out into the world, and I hit some, something, and I get a distance value. Uh, what I have not yet done is the lighting calculation. I have not yet done... Uh, any of the uh, uh, any of the other you know once once you've got that that uh, point with the intersection um, you'll you'll want the surface normal I've done I have the gradient calculation but I have not yet applied it to do lighting or to decide to cast another ray that sort of thing um, but you can kind of get these the the sort of uh, this is like effectively a distance image from from the the viewer to the surface uh, how far away is it so uh, so that's where that that's at. Uh, Things that I, I might uh, want to work on, that, that you'll notice I cheated slightly here. I was also doing a, uh, this is an orthographic projection, so I'm just casting it straight out. I, I was having trouble. Uh, it's very easy with these things when you're sort of trying to get an image out the other side, uh, trying to figure out what's going wrong. And so, you know, orthographic projection is simpler. Just do that, start there. But uh, I, should, I should do a proper uh, per perspective projection. 
and then uh, and then obviously add lighting. Um, I, I, it's, this is a, quite a while back, but some of you may recall I did a ray tracer long ago in in uh, uh, in uh, in fourth as well, uh, also using an integer math. And uh, so far, at least, this technique has had the the virtue that it uh, it doesn't run into uh, a lot of the fun, the sort of futziness that that the, that the ray tracing hit. I um, with ray tracing, I, I had to be super worried about how many bits of precision I had, uh, and sort of how the uh, you know how that related to uh, uh, you know the angles I was doing. I had to cheat a lot there. I was using a bunch of uh, a bunch of calculations where I had to. Uh, I would have, if I was sort of doing it honestly, completely in integers, I would have had to have sine and cosine tables and whatnot. And here I've been been able to largely fall back on just integer calculations with the, with the most complicated one being square root. So uh, it seems promising, uh, and uh, and it's certainly one, one other difference is that when I did ray tracing before, the the amount of time to just to sweep through was quite large, whereas this is you know fast enough that I've been able to put it just in the slide deck and toggle it back and forth. Um, so, any questions? Any 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 reactions to the readability of the font in the slide deck? Uh, <laughs> what's that? It's better now. <laughs> is it is it sufficiently better that that, that it's a, it's a tolerable thing, or am I am I just indulging everyone in reading reading a dreadful font? Indeed. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I, I when I the other one the, the sort of minimalism was great for getting for really forcing me to think about uh, to think about sort of how how sort of succinct could I be? But I think in some ways the, the very arbitrary line forces a number of concessions in this one that just lacks in the, just a tiny bit. Like if you'll notice like the letter K, for example, has this funny, you know, it's just a, a single Bayesian curve there, whereas in the new font it can be straight lines, you know. Yeah. And there's three lines in a K, or like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uppercase E, for example, uh, to stay in my three-stroke budget had to be one, two, and uh, a curvy line for the, the L, and just having the dispensation of, you know, E's consist of straight lines. <laughs> So I have not tried this for the new font. Um, for the old font, I actually did uh, succeed in uh, figuring out how to export it to uh, as a true type font. As a true type font, and so it was. And then what happens? Uh, well, it's fine. I, I actually, I think I have a copy of it sitting around somewhere. I've I've forgotten how I did it, but I, I believe it wasn't too hard to do. So I could probably figure out it again. If you could recreate it, maybe post the link to the list. There's yeah. Indeed. So, necessarily working right now. I sent something to the mailing list that didn't propagate. So, so this this unfortunately is not just a link to the slides as you can view. This is a link where you could clone the repository, run the program that then shows the slides. Which, as I mentioned in the in the talk, is one of the substantial caveats but caveats with doing the the the, the slides this way. I if I'm going to do more of this. Um, I probably should figure out a way to make it possible to export uh, the presentation. I have a on you to uh, recap that short explanation and send that short explanation and the link. I will do so. List. And that way Dave will have something and I will feel like I didn't drop the ball by pushing it to you. Sounds like a plan. Indeed. <laughs> in in three strokes per character, right? <laughs> that that would.
would be challenging, I imagine. Well, I mean, if you think about it, you know, the uh, Chinese language itself, the handwritten stuff, is like 5,000 plus characters from the original writing. Right? So it's like the simplified Chinese is... I don't think they cut the number of characters out. I think the characters themselves are relatively in stroke. So, 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 so intri intriguing, intriguingly, the um, the uh, the sign distance function uh, representation for fonts is actually kind of interesting in the sense that it it's um, because it uh, because it's sort of an image space representation um, where where it's been particularly popular is in game engines. They will use it to uh, have a you know have a font that they want to decal on the surface of objects, and uh, I I've often wondered. Um, whether whether you would get sort of a, an acceptable trade-off with more complicated scripts because uh, it's a fair it, it uses uh, sort of memory relatively efficiently in the scheme of things where you're not uh, you're you're uh, you're sort of blurring together details uh, on ba on boundaries where there's lots of complexity where you you might not notice it so I've often wondered yeah how how badly would a Chinese font make it through all of that and yeah it'd be an interesting thing to it's see kind of hard but uh, you know. Uh, lots, uh, most of the Chinese characters are composite, so they're built from uh, uh, smaller, simpler units. Mm -hmm. So if you have, uh, you know, characters which can be scaled, uh, stretched, mm -hmm. scaled uh, arbitrarily, mm -hmm. that will make uh, it uh, much easier to construct the whole, uh, the whole uh, character set mm -hmm. with a very limited uh, basic mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. There's this um, uh, one of the input methods. Uh, I think it's Kang G dates back to, to a um, to a, a a physical hardware system for the Apple II, where they would take advantage of some of these properties of, of, of the characters right, being combined. Right. And in the in modern versions of it, obviously, it's all just a, a, a lookup table. But in the original versions, they would try to algorithm. You would have a bunch of the, the radicals and then try to combine them according to rules. And then there was a bunch of data. To supplement this in, in cases where the the, the the automatic rules failed to combine them successfully, and they were able to fit, fit in the whole a, a good chunk of the whole set circa Apple II era. That, that's a very uh, very very useful technique in that they, they try to encode uh, the the components and the map into the uh, English keyboard, you know, 20, 27 characters and. Uh, and then it uses uh, five characters to encode uh, 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 a Chinese character. So I think uh, uh, if you uh, if you choose the mapping uh, carefully, you know, uh, generally there's a very very little uh, very little conflict. So the same code generally uh, most likely can encode several. Different characters, mm. but if you choose the, the mapping carefully, uh, you can minimize that uh, that conflict, and that makes the uh, uh, that makes the uh, uh, typing system uh, more accurate and uh, less. Do, 
might I ask, do you use any of the typing systems, and yeah. do you have an opinion on what, what their sort of well, virtues? Well, I learned one and stick with it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're fanatic, uh -huh. and uh, and and uh, there's uh, many many different schemes. You, do you use one that's phonetic or spatial or? Uh, no, Changji. Uh. Because the inventor uh, was my classmate. Ah, well, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Cool. Well, we, we've, we've long since passed my talk, so I'm going to hand this to you. Dennis.
Okay, now, wait a minute, that's, now can you hear me? Okay, what I did since uh, fourth day, last fourth day, was uh, I wrote a GUI in fourth. Okay, and as you can see from the title, it's a proof of concept of a graphical user interface implementing in the GNOME toolkit, GTK, and the fourth language, I used fourth. Okay. And you understand basically what a GUI is. It makes you, uh, it makes your applications easier to use because they have a visual uh, aspect to them. And uh, fourth, as you know, you can uh, write code pretty quickly if uh, you are a quick programmer. <laughs> anyway, G4, the reason I chose that, it supports on many architectures, not only uh, x86, but ARM and PowerPC and you name it. It also lets you, if you're running, say, under Linux or under Windows, it lets you uh, use the libraries. So you can write, so you can use code that you don't have to write. Now, when it comes to a GUI, the buttons, the slide bars, all those other nice things, they have things called callbacks, so that when you click on something, some action has to take, uh, has to occur. That's what I wrote in fourth. And the nice thing about fourth is the code is small. Okay, now I didn't draw this uh, GUI programmatically. I used a builder tool. It's called Glade. Glade. Glade, as in the air freshener, or it's either air freshener or uh, uh, you know for furniture polish. Huh? Yeah, yeah, Glade, yes. And I was able to come up with a proof of concept. You know, it's nice. It did everything that I needed. And the nice thing about using Glade, it generates an XML file that represents what the thing looks like, what your GUI will look like. And the nice thing about it is that you can see what you're going to be using. It gives you a visual uh, representation. The one that I did, it consists of a window, a menu, and status, and a button. Okay, and all these things are, are called, you know, objects, just to make them simple. Then what you can do is you can then associate for each one of those GUI objects a callback some code that will get executed when this uh, thing gets uh, activated. Now, callback functions, yeah, they can be a bear. Uh, like I said here, uh, they, like I said, they do the application specific uh, stuff. Fourth callbacks, uh, what they do is they're able to translate a fourth word and a stack to a C function and its stack. So that when it when the callback gets called, which will be in somewhat like C, this, uh, this thing has the ability to translate that thing into just a regular stack and then will execute your code. Now the callback is interesting because it's not a particular callback. Basically, it's like you. How many here understand what a C prototype is? Prototype function. I got two. Okay. Uh, basically, if you look at the callbacks that I'm using, they have. You can see here they have two parameters coming in, and they're pointers, and the thing returns a void, which means it doesn't return anything. And basically what you do to get a callback is you get the execution token of the word you want to get translated, call callback, 
and this thing will turn it into a C function, which you can then pass to a, uh, a regular C function. Another nice thing about G4 is you can access dynamic libraries, which means you can have code that's already running. You can say, oh, well, I need to have another function. And G4, and G4 will be able to allow you to do that. So you can uh, uh, link in code on the run. Now, like I said, one of the things I did when I did hello fourth, the way I built it was I create a window that has a menu bar at the top with the normal stuff of file, uh, uh, edit, view, help. Then in the middle, I have a, a window that has a toggle button, okay? And then under that, I have a status bar. For the window itself, I assigned a callback on window one destroy. And if you know, if you know anything about the, the way the windows work, you have that X up in the uh, upper uh, right of, the, of your window. You click on that. Well, I then as I associated a callback to destroy the window. I also did the same thing in file, where if you go down to the quit, it does the same thing. Essentially, it does the same thing, but through different methods. And then for the help about, what it does is it comes up with a, another uh, dialog that tells you, you know, what this thing's all about. Okay, and it does the same thing. And for the toggle button. I have a, another uh, callback which does some stuff as I will show you. And obviously toggle means it goes from one state to another, back and forth, back and forth. As you see, the on window destroy uh, callback is used to exit the application when that close icon is pressed. And what happens is when the uh, that uh, callback is called the stack. Uh, you can see here the stack uh, comment shows that you'll have the uh, address of the uh, window object and some user data. And after it's done, it doesn't have anything. Well, what I do is I don't need those uh, two things, so I just drop both of them. And then what I do is uh, I tell the main. Uh, GTK uh, loop to quit, and then I call underscore exit, which just completely exits G fourth. Uh, the uh, if I select the uh, quit button under the file uh, heading, uh, it essentially does the same thing, only instead of calling underscore exit, it just says buy, and then it will just exit uh, fourth. Now again, now for the uh, about activate, uh, when you click on the thing about, it just brings up this other dialog, starts running, and what I do there is, uh, I, again, you can see the stack comment when this thing enters is I get the dialog address. Well, I don't need the user data, so I just reach down and get rid of it. And then what I do is I duplicate that, and then I say GTK dialog run, and then that just starts up the uh, dialog. And then uh, after it's closed, then it just, uh, and when I hit the close button, then the GTK widget hide just gets rid of it. Now the toggle button uh, is used to display either press me or hello fourth, you know, depending on how many times you've clicked on it. And uh, again, the same kind of thing is I don't need the user data, so I get rid of it, I duplicate it, and then uh, I call uh, get button, uh, get the, the label of the button. I test it, I compare the string to see if it's either press me or, or hello fourth. And then that's how I'm able to toggle between the two strings. And then after I've got the, no, the new string that I want, I say GTK button set label, and that updates the label in the button. 
And now, also one of the things I do is for that status bar, I keep track of how many times the button has been pushed. And there, I just, uh, again, it's just real simple. I just keep track of how many times I pushed it, and I just increment it by one, and then just output that as a, as a uh, fourth string. Uh, I can actually show you in the code if you're interested. Now, uh, interesting thing, if you're running with GTK, one of the first things you have to do is initialize GTK, and I do that through GTK init, and I pass to it the uh, argument count and the argument vector. That's, uh, if you're familiar with C, those are the uh, uh, command line options. Then from that, uh, I take the name of that XML file that represents the GUI, and I uh, process it so that it will just it'll be able to, to display the uh, uh, menu itself. And then all the individual widget pointers I have to extract out because I'm going to be manipulating those things. I also assign callbacks to their respective widgets, and then I uh, initialize the uh, status bar to say, you know, uh, I've clicked it zero times. Okay, then I say GTK widget show, and that displays the widget, and then the processing starts, and that's in what's called GTK main. Now, I think it would be nice uh, to uh, actually show this. Oh, I mean, it looks stupid. God damn it. Excuse my French. Oh, well, um, it's broken. <laughs> I diddled with it once too often, and I introduced an error. But maybe I can do the other one. Okay, here we go. Here it is. This is running G4. So you can see the thing says press me. And down here at the, in the status bar it shows what the click count is. So every time I press it, oh, and we also have... Uh, what are these called? Tool tips. Tool tips. So when I press it, you can see it now changed to hello fourth. And the click count was incremented. Press it again. It goes back to press, uh, press me. So you can see I can do that as many times as I want. Now for the uh, about, here's this about window. And I just gave it a title, you know, hello fourth. And my copyright, like this is something valuable. And also with the credit shows, yeah, it was created by me. You know, And after I'm done, I can do that. Oh, but I want to make sure, can I do this again? Yeah, all that, yeah, yeah. But the nice thing about it, you can see I can do this more than once. And also up here, apparently you can put a, a, an image there. I just wanted to get this thing to do what it needed to do. Now, uh, here, if I want, I can click on this guy to quit, and lo and behold, it quits. Okay. Yes. But the nice thing about it, all the code in here was written in fourth. All right, and if you want, here it is. The heading here, these are all the libraries that, I can, that are used in GTK. These are all the include paths to all the include files that I might need. And the nice thing about GTK, there's a, a centralized uh, 
include file, which will include everything else. These functions right here, uh, if you have to do C-like things, like in this case, uh, GTK builder size, it returns the size of a GTK builder structure, okay? Because we don't have anything like that in fourth. All right. And also here, like this get widget, well, I can pass in here a builder pointer, but what I need to do is make sure that it is the widget pointer that I get, and that's what this this guy right here does, this uh, uh, C macro right here. And kind of the same thing with button. And oh, here, this GT, this G signal connect, you pass it a widget, it's callback name, and then the desired callback and any data that has to be pay, uh, uh, passed to that callback. We also have this thing called GTK dialog run, and it does the same kind of thing. Only, again, remember, there are several types of dialogs you have, and what it needs is the base type uh, dialog. Now, these are all the different functions. As you can see, we have some called, it's a, it starts with a declaration of C function. And you can see uh, this is the uh, C name. This is the uh, fourth name, and this is the delect declaration of the parameters. Okay, uh, and these are all the ones that I've used. Okay, now here's the callbacks right right here. This the all, most of the callbacks that I'm using, they come in with two address pointers, and they don't return anything. Then also I have here are the uh, constants that I need to use. I also have a structure. This is for passing errors. And then I can just have here, I'm de oh, here's another important thing that I meant to show you. Uh, the difference between fourth and C strings. In fourth, we have counted strings. That means you have a byte that goes from 1 to 255 that tells you how long a, uh, a, a string is. C has a series of characters that is terminated with a null. These two guys right here, oops, I didn't mean to do that. These two, S string to C string, they'll uh, take a fourth string and turn it into a C string. And likewise, C string to S string will go the other way. That's really important. Because uh, yes, that's why this you see here this s quote press me quote that turns that's a fourth string, but I need to turn it into a c string because I have to pass that to a c function, and that's what this thing does. Then I have all my variables here. Then I have this uh, right here. This is my click count. Then I have here this thing called dot click count. And what it does is it prints out the, uh, it formats the string. You give it a click count, it turns it into a, a C string. And you can see I use the picture format here. And uh, let me tell you, that was uh, handfuls of fun. I, I was really, uh, you know, shaking loose the cobwebs. Now these are my callbacks. And as you can see, to destroy the window, it comes in with two uh, pointers. I don't need them, so I do a, a two drop, and then I say GTK main quit. Well, that will exit the GTK main processing loop, and then after that, then I pass zero exit, which will just exit me from the whole. Uh, application. Now the window destroys one where you click on the uh, quit button. It does, essentially does the same thing, only it calls buy. Oh, and this right here, you can see I take tick, like on window one destroy, I pass it through this uh, callback function, this callback word, it turns it into a constant. And then I save that as on window destroy because I need to pass that 
to a the, to do a G signal cl uh, connect to uh, associate the callback with a uh, uh, GTK object. And uh, here's the toggle button. You can see uh, basically I. Uh, Get the bottom. I get the button pointer. I duplicate the thing to get the label, and I take that label and I convert it from a C string to a four string, and then I take the press me string, convert it to a four string, and do compare. If they're equal, then I say, okay, let me substitute the hello string. But if it wasn't equal to that, then it would say, all right, give me the press string. And then I would set that label. That's how I'm able to change the uh, text within the toggle button. Then I go down here to the status bar, and I need to get its. I need to get the status bar, its context. Then I pop. Basically, I get rid of the old uh, status bar text. Come up with my new status bar text, and I push it out to the uh, to the uh, GUI. And again, here's uh, getting calculating the C function for that. And then uh, I don't think we want to look at that. That's that I'm trying to be able to change the font uh, in the thing, and it's a bear. And allow me to say that it is really tough. Okay. So this is the, okay now. First things first, right here, this is the initialization. I've got the argument count and the argument vectors from the, uh, the call to G4. I then pass those to GTK init. Then I create a new GTK pointer uh, structure. And then I uh, push that uh, on the stack. This is the name of the XML file that I want to display. I turn it from a four string to a C string. I push an error pointer on there, and then I call this function GTK builder add from file. And that creates the, uh, uh, the GUI for you. Then I go through, then I have to get the, uh, from the XML file, I have to be able to get the various widgets. And I need to get the window pointer, the quit menu, the about menu, the about dialog menu, the toggle button, the status bar. Okay. Then here is where I associate for a given, like for the window itself, I have a, it has a destroy callback. Well, I associate on window one destroy with it. And uh, this connects that, and then I just save that as a window ID. And do the same thing for the quit, for the about, for the uh, toggle button. And then here, uh, I get the, uh, uh, I do the same thing for getting the uh, status bar. Then I push the first message on there. Okay. And then here's where I show the menu. I mean, show the GUI, and then I start running it, and that's it. And then you can see what I uh, was able to do with this thing. Again, press me, hello fourth, and quit. And that's it. Now, that says... You now, instead of having to write it in C, you now can write your GUI in fourth. Huh? Yes, you can. Yes. Now, I'm not the first guy to do that. I think MPE fourth does it with GTK. But I, was a, I think I'm the first guy to do it with G fourth. Okay. Yeah? Who did? Oh, yeah, but they have their own. It's uh, Big Fourth or Minos? Well, Minos is there. They, um, Baron has that. But they um, had a GUI demo. They also have Arduino GUI. Right. 
Right. But I, this thing, and now I can run this under Linux. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, this is just a demonstration. Uh, I plan on taking the whole, uh, in fact, let me show you, uh, all the libraries right here, GTK, GDK, Pango, Cairo. Pango is a font kind of thing. I have no idea what ATK is, or GDK, or GIO, or Pang, or GLive. It just, it just when I there's a thing called package config, and it'll tell you what do you need for libraries, what do you need for includes. Oh, it is shockingly complex. Trust me. Yes, but. No, no, not completely. It's I used. So here's the thing. Because I have code that already does what I want it to do, I said, great, I'll use that. Exactly. That's the thing. That's what's nice about it. But then again, uh, I know you kind of go, well, what the hell do you want to write a GUI for? Well, I have my reasons, and there are other things that I'm working on, boys and girls, which I will probably tell you at a later date. Ooh, cool. content. I love content. You love content, yes. And things like, my fourth word isn't working. How do I debug it? <laughs> oh, and remember what I did last year for the fourth thing? P threads. Remember how uh, Chuck was mentioning something that I said, I don't understand. Why would I want to write a thread? Well, I can understand. Why would you want to have a program that's just one thread? P threads are for two or more things operating at the same time. That's what's good about that. Okay? And wouldn't that be neat to be able to debug something like that? Now remember, also what I'm uh, hoping to do in the near future before I become uh, too paleoflatus is uh, I want to be able to marry G4 with a real-time operating system. And once I get that, because pthreads relies on something called thread local storage, I need thread local storage in my RTOS in order to work. Now also, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a a, a, a GUI for that. Think about, because what my goal there is, is to say use something like a, a Raspberry Pi, put a, a LCD display on it, use Minos as my graphical interface, and I can have a programmable hub. Now I know you guys go, well, why would I want to do that? Well, Ting, remember when you wanted to be able to have a USB device? Yes, this would be nice. Hmm? Yeah, that would be nice, because remember your little gizmo you did all those years ago? Uh, I just go, well, wow, I can write this stuff all in fourth, because these, G uh, these RTOSs have USB libraries, so you can develop a USB device along with a hub, and you can add OTG. Anybody know what OTG is? On the go. On the go. Give that man a banana, <laughs> which you understand is uh, when you plug, say, this device into your computer, it says, oh, you just plugged a thumb drive in here. Well, back in the day, you know, when people would go, they go, oh, yeah, this is nice, but, you know, this is a computer itself. I'd love to be able to plug a thumb drive in here and be able to do all sorts of stuff with it. That's what OTG is. In OTG, you have to be able to specify the kind of devices that you want to be uh, hooked up to your device. Well, this will give it to you. Also, there's something uh, USB IP. What it does is, with that, you know how when you plug in a thumb drive to your laptop, it gets connected to your laptop? Well, with USB IP, you can say, no, when I have this particular one, I plug it in, I want it to go over the internet to another computer. 
Yes. That's a nice that's a nice thing. And that could be any device. I remember working on that back, God, eleven years ago. Oh. Yes. So now you see what I'm saying. There are a lot of things you can do now and have a code written in forth. And then can you imagine what it would be like to uh, reverse engineer something like that? Because I read uh, on slash dot that some smart ass uh, came up with a decompiler. So if you write code in C, you come up with binary, the, uh, this decompiler can analyze that binary and generate C code from it. So now, can you imagine what it would be like if they tried to do that with fourth code, especially headless fourth code? Yes, that would be a real bear. Because how many people here know fourth in the world? Uh, it's it's just a, a little easy weensy uh, fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people. A lot of people know how to program in fourth. I mean, at fourth, but in C and God forbid C plus plus. But try that with fourth. You know, that's why I say fourth is a man's language. You know. You have to have a certain level of uh, brass in your programming testicles to be able to implement proper fourth. And I think everyone in this room has that capability. So, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, but I was able to get it. You know, it actually it actually worked. I was shocked. I went, wow. I wrote it in fourth. You know, and I say, well, let's use this function. Let's use this, this, this. Oh, that's great. And just remember, that's one of the things you want to be is a lazy programmer. Yeah, you'd have a different set, of course. Of course, that, I, that, I agree. And also one of the other things is, Remember, this is for the GNOME toolkit. I may want to try to do this under KDE, under uh, MATE, under uh, FL, that's it, FLK, or what is that? FLTK. FLTK, which means then I have other GUI systems that I can run this under. Some of these uh, other GUIs are very lightweight. They don't have a lot of stuff in them. So I'm going, well, that would be really nice. So you can write, you know, like I said, for your uh, for a, a small system, you can say, well, I don't want to use GNOME. That's too big. And KDE, that's same thing, too big. Well, let's try FLTK. Maybe that's uh, a lot smaller. Yeah, remember when the system was 8K? Oh, I know, I know. What, what Linux? This is Linux. Right? This is Linux. Which, which Linux? This is Fedora. 27. Okay, I use Fedora because this is a bleeding edge Linux. It's got, I mean, the absolute latest stuff. Oh, you remember, uh, what was it? Uh, Meltdown, and what was the other one? Spectre? Yeah. Uh, again, my uncle was going, no, you understand, there's Meltdown out there, and, 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 and Spectre, and, oh, well, wait, you're your computer, and, uh, uh, you know, my uncle is a psychologist. He's technically incompetent. So I just go, ah, it's already taken care of. Just relax. Are, are, are you sure? I want your computer to melt down, you know, because uh, I, 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 I'm not going to clean it up. <laughs> you know? Literally, he thought it would, would literally melt. Huh? Well, well, I think Intel's one that started it, just to make themselves look important. Yeah. But the thing, about, again, uh, being able to marry P threads with the GUI, so whatever, you know, whatever application you're looking at, you know, you can uh, write that stuff. So, I, like I said, I... Uh, I just, like I said, I, the only problem with me is I don't write GUIs. I'm a low-level guy. I'm right down there at the register level, you know. Firmware, right? But I, I just, it's just, yeah, it's just, but I figured, well, 
branch out, you know, can't hurt. Yeah. You know. Yes. Really? Um, for like Windows and oh, that, that again. Uh, if I can a access it, if there's a if there's a uh, either a shared object or a static library, yeah, it's just a very simple I can I can uh, go in there and grab the stuff. That's what this uh, up here. Uh, that's what this stuff here is. Okay, right here. Normally, you can see. Normally, I use just the same name, like here, GTK. Dialog run, GTK dialog run. Sometimes I have to change the name, like this one, G Signal Connect to capital G Signal Connect. Or how about this one, GTK init? I have to go capital GTK init. But it, it lines it up. It just sets it up. So I'm going, yow, I like that. That's, that's really good. Another thing I could, I mean, it's just as long as they're, if there's, like I said, if there's a library out there, I can use it. And that's the whole idea. It means you've got tons of resources. If you've ever seen uh, the size of, uh, oh, take glibc or libc, you know, the C runtime library. I mean, if you were to print out the documentation, it'd be, what, several thousand pages? I mean, no, no, they, they, they do have it. There is... There is a website that has uh, the, li the C runtime library. Yeah. Just, you know, and it's a PDF. If you want, it'll generate a PDF. I would suggest not printing it out, not to mention how expensive it would be and how thick it would be. But think of. Uh, huh? Oh, yeah, it better be double sided, or uh, uh, Kinko's is going to make a lot of money off you. You know, and the only, as far as I'm concerned, the only good thing it would be is, uh, uh, you know, a anti-home invasion uh, weapon. You know, just put it on a, a, a lot like a chain, and someone comes through the front door, and go, and just like a pendulum, woof. You know, and they'll be uh, in pieces. So. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's that's what I mean. And when somebody adds a little bit to it, it's not. Oh yeah, that's right. So yeah, just yeah, keep electronic. So, but uh, like I said, I've got a lot of projects, and one of them, like I said, uh, I want to be able to uh, debug a uh, fourth word, where I can set breakpoints, where I can step over or into a fourth word, and say if it's like on uh, a PC, I can then switch into assembly language when I get down to a primitive. You know, and the nice thing about it, see this is why I like GeForce. Many architectures, and it has the capability of, run, of being built standalone. Have you tried compiling it to an executable for your little bit? Oh, uh, no. I, I, as a standalone, uh, that's what's that called? Safe system? No. Yeah. I, no, I haven't. I. And what happens? It, it, it is possible, certainly. It, it's. Uh, yes. And the nice thing, it would be being able to do headless. Forth. Yes. So, uh, plenty of things. This is probably some of the stuff I'm going to do when I'm retired, uh, up in my mountain home. Uh, no, I haven't. Open pipe. Yeah. And it has output. Yeah. You'd like to get that back into the board. Oh, sure, yes. Oh, that's the thing. Again, they call it open pipe. It's, uh, oh, yeah, that's the thing. They have that capability. It's, uh, in fact, where have I seen it? 
look under p, look under p threads. P threads, I think, has that capability to have a read and a write pipe. So you. Yes. Oh, that would be nice. I, I, I said, I just, you know, that's the other thing. I, I told you I've got uh, P threads uh, completely implemented. I just need to clean it up, you know. So, and then just come up with some silly kind of a application, you know, that I can write a GUI for and be able to... Uh, do stuff and show that yes, fourth is uh, a viable language. Well, correct. There, there are a ton of people doing it, and some fresh. And this, this, there's been a bunch. This guy that wrote yeah, last night. Um, oh yeah. Stone knife fourth. Oh, yeah. yeah, I thought that that guy was a headhunter when I first saw his name. Because I, I, I have a, I, I get a lot of email for jobs, and you know, I thought, boy, this guy's command of the English language is pretty good. He can't be a headhunter. He, he certainly got. It. I haven't figured out exactly what he's got, but he's pursuing something. Yes. Yes. So uh, I'm feeling very good uh, about what I'm doing. Uh, when I get uh, an RTOS running, uh, I can. Nice thing about it is, I can test that under Linux using QEMU, where literally this thing will be running in its own little environment, and it'll be real time. And, re and that's the thing. It's when I talk about real time, I'm talking about preemptive real time, that kind of stuff. Not, you know, there is a multitasker in uh, fourth. It's a cooperative one, which means you have to figure out when you're going to do a task pitch. Yes. So, uh, and plus, like I said, uh, G fourth has an object-oriented fourth, which reminds me, I've got, remember that book, uh, a uh, little book, I uh, forgot who it was. I have things I want to give spread around just in case, you know, we don't want that knowledge to disappear. Object-oriented programming is very important. I know, I know, like, huh? But one of the things is you need to have an object-oriented paradigm to use it. And if you don't have that, then, you know, you're pissing up a rope. So, anyway, uh, anything else? Well, okay, who's next? Break time, okay. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, uh, ramble on. Uh, I, 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 it's not, you, you can see what happened. It's not right. Remember, it's a POC. Remember, POCs are a subclass of POSs because POCs are somewhat functional POSs. Okay? And people look at it and they go, Harbor, what the hell are you doing here? And I'll be going, eh. Don't remember. Hey, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to get the thing to work, so please leave me alone. Okay? So, uh, you may... Uh, okay, I'm coming through. I have to hit power real quickly. Ah, but 
That may just be me. Oh, there we go. Now I'm getting them. I got a a test from George. And an email from Brad. There's a complete
Okay, we're going to do a short testing testing. Just to be sure that the interwebs is up. And then... Uh, uh, let, let's make sure that the audio is up and the... I'm Andreas Wagner, and I wanted to uh, make the case for using fourth, using FIFOs and fourth as an alternative to stacks. And uh, so, uh, first, uh, I wanted to see whether uh, stack juggling is really a fact of life in concatenative languages. Whether it's something that we always need that is uh, unavoidable. Uh, Stack juggling is, and it um, has been called the worst part of fourth. Uh, fourth has um, a lot of things I like about it. The, probably the one thing I don't like about it is all the stack juggling that seems to uh, um, be at times unavoidable with uh, with fourth. But uh, at the same time, it also drove a lot of innovation in fourth because uh, we try to uh, we we come up with all sorts of ways to make things simpler so that we don't need to do stack juggling, right? So a lot of the uh, innovations in fourth came from uh, the desire to avoid stack juggling in a way, uh, to make things simpler. Uh, so first, I uh, I looked at uh, I wanted I, my first thought was to look for uh, where stack juggling occurs, so then we can figure out how to get rid of it. Perhaps uh, so. I notice if you if a word consumes too much, we often do things like dupe, to dupe, over, tuck, uh, store stuff on the return stack, and uh, for la um, for later, and uh, to say to save it for later. Essentially, if uh, we we will need it later if the if the words afterwards consume too much, and uh, the the. Um, and then if a word produces too much, we may need to swap it or rotate it um, or store it on the return stack to get it out of the way or uh, pick it or roll it, um, but you shouldn't use those two. Uh, and uh, to get the item out of the way, essentially. But, and there's a, there's a gray, there's a, the uh, division between these two is kind of a gray division. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, uh, Made me think that well maybe juggling is a producer consumer problem, and uh, that of course implies that uh, that reminded me of FIFO's, uh, the FIFO data structure, uh, and uh, so a producer uh, that yeah it implies that we might need to FIFO's might be a good uh, data structure to solve this to induce parameter data flow and uh, alleviate congestion of parameters on the parameter stack. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I wrote some wrappers in G4 to get a feel for what this would feel like to use. Uh, I have like a consume and produce word. I made, a, um, I made a circular buffer as my FIFO in, for, in G4, and I wrote a consume and produce word that will consume and produce from that FIFO. So instead of uh, pushing and or um, popping arguments in assembly in uh, the front of a word definition, I would do uh, consumes, consume words instead of pop. And uh, at the end of a word, if I want to produce something or not, I would, uh, I would use the produce word instead of uh, push. Uh, 
So uh, in the first example, I have uh, I multiply two times two and uh, three times three, and then I add the, the I add uh, the two results, and I get thirteen. And I need to uh, rot I need to do some stack juggling here. And uh, before that, I, I some um, and then after that, somebody came up with the idea of uh, I think uh, parallel concatenation to uh, to do these these two in parallel. Uh, that's uh, done in some concatenative languages such as uh, Kitten and uh, I think a few others. Uh, it's pretty new, but uh, I couldn't think of a way to do that without some uh, awkward uh, parsing or uh, look ahead or something like that. And I think that's how it's implemented in those concatenative languages, which is um, not ideal. But uh, I guess if you did this as an HDL, such as in like gel forth, which I was which I'm working on, and uh, you could do this as a, um, you could have parallel concatenati concatenation and as uh, compiled to uh, Boolean algebra or something like that. But uh, if you want to do it on ARM, you might need to have some parsing of, so of sorts to do that. And uh, with FIFOs, I just have, uh, I just have this. I just do times times plus dot, and I get 13. I don't need to do any stack juggling or any of that uh, because it's first in. Uh, first out. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, so it feels much much clearer that way. And uh, so uh, then I tried experimenting some more, and I tried uh, the within word to, to detect whether to de determine whether a character is printable or not. And uh, Uh, I, I put in the consume and produce in there um, just to show where it is. Uh, that would just be embedded in the assembly in, in a, um, as I, as, So uh, all I have to do uh, um, these are greater than, less than, equal, and uh, and so on. Uh, and you can, so uh, the rules are different in uh, Five oh four, five oh fourths versus uh, stack fourths, or the, uh, the guidelines are different. So, in uh, with stacks, uh, I avoid having a, a variable number of items on the stack. In uh, a five oh fourth, I don't really mind if there's a lot of stuff on the stack on the in the five oh. Uh, but what you do need to to do is uh, after. You, after um, a word should clean up after itself, because you can't have stuff accumulating further down the FIFO. You can have stuff accumulate further down the stack, and it won't really matter, although it's, it's bad form. But you could do that. But uh, in FIFO, uh, fourth, the rules are different. Um, the guidelines and best practices are different. Uh, so compare this. I just grabbed before this talk. I just grabbed the uh, definition of within from Jones fourth. I don't know if this is the best way to define it, but uh, I just think it maybe it shows that it's, it's um, a FIFO could be simpler to to use, and it's uh, it's, uh, it's concatenated. It preserves or so. Uh, so uh, some things I noticed from using FIFOs. Uh, so in fourth, uh, just um, as we know, fourth and parameters flow from left to right. And uh, words process them on the right uh, where they arrive, um, also from left to right. And uh, if I want some some like parameters to be part of the definition, I just all I pretty much have to do is move the colon to the uh, to the left um, to swallow them up. Uh, the this is sort of like the which isn't really necessary because a the definition is the a FIFO is just an array essentially. Um, if you uh, store it onto Flash or something like that, you just all you have to do is store it as an array and uh, the, uh, I noticed that the definitions tend to be cl neatly clustered downstream instead of uh, 
I, instead of having the tendency to be interleaved with parameters uh, to reduce a stack juggling. Uh, so I, uh, definitions are neatly clustered uh, downstream, which is convenient. And uh, I also found myself more rearranging, I found myself rearranging words at edit time more than I did um, juggling parameters at runtime, which is what I wanted. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, and then I thought, well, I, I just went, took it another a step further, um, and I asked, uh, is there any sense in replacing the return stack with the return FIFO? And my first thought was, well, of course not. Uh, I need to get to the machine code words at the leaves of the definition, the code words, and uh, there may be side effects and all that stuff. Uh, this is not a functional programming language exactly. And uh, then I thought, well, if I, I just thought about what would happen if I did use a FIFO instead of a, a FIFO um, for return function uh, returns uh, instead of a, a return stack. And that would be, uh, and then I remembered, uh, well, if you are uh, using a FIFO to keep track of, uh, of this sort of thing, it, you would be doing a breadth first search rather than a depth first search, and uh, I don't exactly know how, I don't know much about how Haskell is actually implemented, but um, in my simplistic understanding of it, they might do, they do lazy evaluation, and uh, that operates in a sort of a breadth first search manner. So, uh, and C also has sort of a lazy evaluation, which is, but only in the context of conditionals, such as like if statements short circuit evaluation in the if statements. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I'd be doing lazy evaluation if I used FIFOs for the return stack. And uh, yeah, uh, so uh, but first as an aside, uh, dictionary condition, is this the same problem as um, parameter stack congestion, uh, perhaps it is. Uh, I'd avoid, um, so um, what I don't want to do to, uh, what I'm trying to avoid with, uh, to um, resolve the problem of, or try to resolve the problem of um, fragmentation or uh, congestion in the dictionary uh, is uh, I don't want to have a non-interactive uh, offline fourth compiler that just takes a fourth source code file and turns into a fourth standalone binary, and that's it. Uh, I think fourth isn't exactly um, great at interactivity after the source code has been compiled to the dictionary, because you have words further down that pile up, and uh, you, don't, you don't interact, you don't call them directly as much anymore. Um, some of them may be completely shadowed by other definitions, and uh, I think that the two uh, methods for uh, removing words from the dictionary is forget, which causes holes, holes and fragmentation in the dictionary. And there's marker, which does not cause fragmentation, but only truncates the dictionary uh, up to the marker that you set. Uh, so those are really uh, to that uh, with the help. Uh, and uh, so uh, I put, so I thought, well, I could put a, uh, this it seems to be similar to the return stack versus return FIFO thing. So I put numbers and uh, words, word definitions and all everything into one FIFO. I could do something like I could consume. Uh, so I put uh, numbers and words into the same FIFO. So the return stack and uh, the parameter stack are combined into um, one into a single FIFO and. Uh, so I consume a, I consume parameters. I do something with it, like in the uh, within um, example. I do something with those parameters, and then I produce whatever is non-reducible and left over from that uh, computation. And uh, I, uh, I use the, and some some of these uh, definitions will some of the non-reducible expressions that result. result from something from a um, computation are 
they sort of linger in the return stack. And I think of that as the, dic the dictionary. So uh, that sort of combines the dictionary with the, with the return FIFO. And uh, basically having definitions linger in the uh, return FIFO uh, effectively creates a dictionary FIFO, which, but the, the whole dictionary is moving because it's a FIFO. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how to pursue it to flash. Maybe I would just power by having a capacitor there just to just enough to do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, then, uh, so uh, some people with uh, in stack based boards, they uh, make floating stacks and uh, avoid creating many, many different stacks for different purposes. Uh, creates fragmentation in the memory space. And uh, I think fragmentation is uh, but only if uh, the partition or on your disk or on your flash memory or, or wherever uh, is oblivious to the contents that it is describing. So uh, if you have like a partition or a stack or a FIFO and uh, your system has a complete understanding of everything inside that fragmentation is not as much as you because uh, it's, it, it can resolve that issue on, on a case by case basis according to its design. And uh, so I, I would say marker and forget our symptoms of fragmentation in the, there was a paper that talked about, uh, as an aside, there was a paper that talked about how uh, disk fragmentation is a network flow or a network flow problem. I unfortunately can't find that paper anymore, but uh, I'll try to find it at some point. Uh, so thank you. Any any questions? Uh, I have. I'm somewhat familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Really deep stacks. Uh, I was thinking of. Uh, I'm actually using it on the you know the PSOC 5LP chip that has this uh, CPLD logic fabric. I'm thinking I could just put the whole logic fabric in a FIFO because it's um, addressed in such a way that makes it convenient. And I could. So it's a huge FIFO, um, but stacks versus FIFO, so it doesn't. Really how much you have in there, only that you clean up after you after you're done. So I yeah. 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 But like I said, your idea is great. I mean, if you think of the uh, read arrays, mm -hmm. they're, you know, the connection between chips, it's a FIFO of only one, but yeah. big deal. I mean, you Yeah. With two, you could have a FIFO like on a port of some sort. Yeah. Where then you can do data flow, where you just bring in things and do the computation and shove them off to another port. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I like the idea. Great, because this is there are applications where data flow is perfect. One of those is uh, doing a fast Fourier transform or just any kind of transform. Mm -hmm. And you want to transform it and send it out. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, really. <laughs> Smart idea, that, but that's different. That's thinking different because of the, you know, a stack versus a FIFO. It's there. I don't know. Uh, it's like they sound like they're opposites. Yeah, they're sort of like duels of each other somehow. Yes, exactly. So yeah, I, I do. I like that. It's uh, it definitely has uh, application. Yeah, I have a, I have a demo um, 
of it. Uh, just I, I was thinking about putting a paste bin up, a paste um, with just like a piece of simple G fourth code, so you could just try it out. People could try it out without doing any work, just to that try it out, nice, yeah. feel it out. Yeah. Yeah. My stuff is proof of concept, and like I told you before. Proof of concept, is, a POC is a subset of POS, so <laughs> you don't want to be comfortable. Yeah. Ting? Um, I'm kind of confused about the terminology. You know, stack is fine. I, I think uh, uh, maybe, no. uh, and I'm not uh, correct uh, in assuming that you are talking about pipes. Yes. So if I put one on the stack and then two on the stack, right, right. if it's a yeah, I'm stack, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. two is what's it, going to be on the top a, of the stack. Uh, it's a pipe. pipe. Yeah, it's a, a pipe. pipe. Yeah, this is like a concatenative data flow system, and uh, there are there's some people doing flow-based programming, uh, but they all have like visual drag and drop things, which I'm not so into, to be honest. Um, but uh, oh, yeah. I'm just gonna say um, one solution to that is um, like an FPC where they can that where they implement local variables. Mm -hmm. So the stack elements are called by name only within that definition so that um, um, so you don't have to do a lot of the swapping and stuff like that. You yeah. Call the, call the stack elements by name. Yeah. Local uh, local definitions are one, uh, one other approach. but And also uh, the, co the machine code words, they are effectively using the registers, which are kind of uh, like using local uh, names for for values the machine the assembly assembled uh, definitions um, I was looking at uh, using this uh, uh, you know not theory where they have uh, like um, there's a, a variant of that called like tangle machines which is a um, model of computing where they use uh, something similar to knots uh, for as a model of computing, so they don't have to. Uh, it's. A, I was thinking of using it as a way to avoid named parameters even within a core definition, but I haven't finished that. I could. I could do a quick demo if anyone. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here I. I just. Uh, just uh, have like um, I use lit because this is um, built inside a high-level G fourth, um, and I need to get the the numbers on the into the FIFO instead of the stack. So I just put a one, two, three, four in uh, the FIFO, and then I just do one plus, one plus, one plus, one plus, and I just I can uh, increment all the numbers in the FIFO uh, as many times as. And uh, so that's one example. Uh, how this can uh, be good for as like uh, it can be good for fourth that are oriented towards uh, being an eight, a hardware description language, um, such as like for gel fourth, where I have it a uh, um, very highly parallel uh, large vectors um, type languages, and uh, this. this um, and then I have, of course, the uh, other example where I just have, I check whether something is printable. Uh, this is, let's make it a bit smaller. Uh, if something is printable, I just have uh, the range and then I just do this check. Um, that's basically the example I had in the slide. Uh, and I can check whether a character is printable, uh, such as like character A print. It is printable, so that's all I have to do pretty much. Check whether it's printable. Yeah, it's just two simple examples. I have more stuff I've done with this, and I, I like it so far. Basically, the only um, thing that remains is sometimes if my if I'm 
uh, without the uh, return, without having a return FIFO and just having a return stack. Sometimes I have like dupe and stuff in the. I have the. I use the word dupe occasionally in this high this uh, FIFO wrapper around G fourth. I sometimes still use dupe, but not. I don't think I'd use it in a return FIFO fourth. Mm-hmm. Where decommutating, that means you have a telemetry stream coming in to be able to extract out the fields yeah. as necessary because telemetry, you know, it's a you have a major frame and then each one of these little things represents a sample. Well, there's this concept called uh, supercom, which means you can repeat, you know, if you need to do a higher speed or you can subcom, which means okay, if I my next frame, well, this field will be something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this concept, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I, I really like it. Thank you. Now, um, uh, to uh, commutate, that means you got to take all these inputs mm -hmm. and be able to somehow sample and put those things into the screen. Well, you can right you time. can factor the FIFO. You can pull it pull out part because the FIFO is just an array more than a stack is. Yeah. Um, so you can just factor this. You can just slice up the FIFO into factors. That's the, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're talking about really making uh, something like again telemetry, and telemetry is used everywhere, not only in the space where mm -hmm. it originally was, but automotive, uh, you know, especially like in racing. Even you know, I, I can't. I mean, you can even do it for your own car if you needed it. But that's another story. You know, yeah. If you do that, you could probably end up going to jail. <laughs> so, but yes, this the FIFO concept in fourth. I like that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking probably my next project would for this would be uh, to uh, do a assembler with FIFO fourth. So because uh, you know uh, lazy evaluation is effectively short circuiting unnecessary code. So this would uh, mean you could have sort of, sort of an optimizing assembler this way. Very machine code. Right. Avoid unnecessary computation at runtime, yes. perhaps. What is that? Uh, somehow, our, you know, these more modern processors will reschedule uh, uh, some of these language instructions. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Wow, that's something. So, <clears throat> yeah, I like it. It's thanks. Very, very uh, uh, intuitive. I like. Uh, I like that. Okay. All right. Anything else, sir? All good? Thank you. next. So Kevin, are we done? I don't know. It looks like we're done. We, I think so. So um, I guess we call it done for today, and we shall stop streaming. Eventually, the web will catch up to what was last on the screen. Bye, folks. See you next month.